So as Natalie mentioned, my name is Megan, and I have called this presentation Updates on Women in Hemophilia, Exploring Factor VIII and Factor IX Deficiencies, Abnormal Bleeding Symptoms, and What It Means to Be a Hemophilia Carrier in 2021. So as Natalie mentioned, we ran a similar presentation last year. So although I will touch on some of the same things, just to make sure it stays um, you know, a complete presentation, I've added in a number of updates regarding new research on carriers. So Natalie has already introduced me, but just to disclose my two different roles. So the first one is as a nurse coordinator with the Inherited Bleeding Disorders Program here in Kingston. And then the second is actually as a research nurse for Dr. Paula James, who is on the call right now. Dr. James is one of our adult hematologists here in Kingston, and she runs a really large research program. And we have a number of projects that are devoted to hemophilia carriers. Other team members are Lisa Thibault, who is the other nurse coordinator and is also on um, this call. Julie Grable is our, uh, our um, research coordinator. And then Michaela Spence is on this call as well, and she's one of our graduate students. So I'm happy to be giving this presentation on behalf of the larger team. So to get us started, I am going to quickly go over what I have called fast facts about hemophilia. And I suspect that most of you already know this information, so I'm gonna go pretty quick. So hemophilia is a bleeding disorder where people bleed longer than normal because their blood does not contain enough clotting factor. There are two subtypes, hemophilia A and B, depending on which, sub which clotting factor is missing. Hemophilia A is a deficiency in factor VIII, and it is the more common subtype, occurring in about 1 in 4,000 male births, whereas hemophilia B is the less common subtype, and it's a deficiency in factor IX, and is, occurs in about 1 in 20,000 male births. So these prevalence numbers are actually fairly new information by a, a Canadian team in Hamilton who published it in 2019, and it's interesting because they found a much higher prevalence number than was previously thought. Hemophilia severity is classified based on the amount of clotting factor found in a person's blood. So a person with mild hemophilia will have between 5 and 40% of the normal amount of clotting factor. A person with moderate hemophilia will have between 1 and 5, and a person with severe hemophilia will have less than 1%. Our next, next um, fast facts are about the inheritance pattern. So hemophilia is a congenital disorder, meaning that it is most commonly passed down through family members. Although as you see in that second bullet point there, it does arise spontaneously in about 30% of cases. So when it is genetically transmitted, it has an X-linked recessive inheritance pattern. So the graphic here shows that means that a man with hemophilia will pass the affected X chromosome to all of his daughters, but none of his sons. Whereas a mother who has an affected X chromosome has a 50-50 chance that either any of her sons or daughters will be affected. Now, a son who is affected will not have a second normal X chromosome because he's going to have a Y. Whereas a daughter who's affected will have a second normal X chromosome. And this sort of explains, along with a few other things I won't get into, why we see a more severe disease state in males than we do in females. So how does hemophilia affect women? So I hope some of you will have seen these internet memes about how it started and how it's going. So this is just one of many floating around the internet that I thought it was particularly cute. But the concept is to just show how things used to be and how it's going now. So I wanted to do the same thing with regards to hemophilia carriers. So how it started is that historically females affected by hemophilia were seen as silent carriers. They were not recognized as having abnormal bleeding symptoms, and it was also not widely recognized that they could even have abnormal factor levels. Care focused almost exclusively on males, and it was believed that a woman's carrier status was really only important during pregnancy with the possibility of having an affected male child. But how it's going, thanks to a lot of great research and advocacy, is that it is now widely recognized that females who are carriers of hemophilia can and do have abnormal bleeding, even sometimes if they have abnormal fac normal factor levels. And it is also now recognized that women and girls can have abnormal factor levels, and as such, they can have hemophilia. 
So this brings us to a fairly new way of thinking about women and girls affected by hemophilia. So a very recent publication that just came out in April of this year, and you'll actually see that Dr. James is one of the co-authors. It's this one, which outlines the new words, the new nomenclature that should be used in regards to hemophilia carriers. So what I like about it is it aims to just better capture the wide variety of situations that carriers can experience and to more appropriately label their individual situation. The reality is that no two carriers are the same and there's a wide range of ways that hemophilia can affect women and girls. So as you see on the left-hand side there, I just put a box around it. The first section is acknowledging that women and girls can have abnormal factor levels and so they can in fact have hemophilia. Now these females should be labeled as having hemophilia that corresponds to their factor level. This is almost always mild, but it can be moderate and severe on very rare occasions. Now it still might feel odd for some women to think of themselves as having hemophilia, but the World Federation of, Hemoph of Hemophilia, for example, they clearly state in their most recent carrier document that a woman with an abnormal factor level is no different from a man with the same factor level. She has hemophilia. This update is one that is likely going to take some time to reach the wider population and the wider medical community, but it should replace that historical idea that only men and boys can have hemophilia. Women and girls can have hemophilia too. It's more rare and it's um, less severe, but they can have it. So then if we move to the right-hand side here, this is for females who have normal factor levels above 40%. And most hemophilia carriers will have factor levels somewhere between 40 and 60. But what this document acknowledges is that even with a normal factor level, women can still experience abnormal bleeding symptoms. So a woman with a normal factor level, but abnormal bleeding symptoms would be referred to as a symptomatic hemophilia carrier whereas a woman with a normal factor level and no bleeding symptoms would be referred to as an asymptomatic hemophilia carrier. Now this last category does fit with that historical concept of a silent carrier. But what I like about this graphic and the new nomenclature is that it just very clearly shows that the asymptomatic hemophilia carrier is one option and that many other women can and do have abnormal bleeding or abnormal factor levels. This graphic is something that I'm gonna to refer to a number of times throughout the presentation. So you can kind of uh, take a good look at it there. So how many women are affected by hemophilia? The short answer is that we don't really know. It has been estimated that for every male with hemophilia, there are four hemophilia carriers related to him, whether it's mothers, sisters, aunts, grandmothers. Another important estimate is that for every three males with a factor A deficiency, so hemophilia A, there is a female who also has a factor A deficiency, so has mild hemophilia A as well. This is important because we previously thought it was really rare for women to have hemophilia, but as we're learning, there are more women and girls out there than was previously thought. So what's important to note with these estimates, which researchers are quite confident are true, these numbers are not reflected in our international and national hemophilia registries, which means that there are many unidentified women and girls affected by hemophilia, and we need to get a bit better at identifying them. Identification of women affected by hemophilia is important because if we don't recognize the bleeding risk or recognize those abnormal bleeding symptoms earlier, it can just have a negative effect on the health and quality of life of that person, and it can delay access to appropriate care and treatment. For example, we know from research that the women who have the rare, severe, and moderate forms of hemophilia, their age at diagnosis has found to be significantly delayed compared to males, even though they usually develop their first joint hemorrhage around the same age. So how do we determine if a woman, how a woman is affected by hemophilia? Which of those five categories in the new nomenclature graphic does she fit into? So for this, we need to think about testing. And the best way I've seen this explained is by separating the topic of testing into two different issues. So the first is genetic transmission. So does the woman possess an altered gene for hemophilia or not? And the second separate question is what is her individual bleeding risk? And the first time I heard it explained this way, they were very um, good at highlighting 
that both of these questions do not necessarily need to be answered at the same time, and they can really be evaluated as two separate issues. In the question of genetic transmission, the gold standard is genetic testing, which has been available since the early 1980s, depending on where you live. For genetic testing, it's important to differentiate between an obligate carrier and a potential carrier. And so for this, we need to think back to that hemophilia inheritance slide. So all daughters of a male with hemophilia will inherit the affected X chromosome. And so they are obligate carriers for whichever type of hemophilia their fathers had. Also in most circumstances, any mother of a son who has hemophilia would also be an obligate carrier. However, you have, there is those 30% um, of cases where there's a spontaneous mutation. So that's why it's not always 100% true. But for these obligate carriers, the question of genetic transmission is not really a question as we know that we already know that they carry the gene. But what we don't know for these carriers is what is their individual bleeding risk? So that second consideration becomes a bit more important. Where in those five categories of our graphic do they fall into? Now for potential carriers, this is someone in whom the carrier status is not known. So the question of genetic transmission is a really big question. This would be any daughter of a known hemophilia carrier who will have a 50-50 chance of inheriting the mutation or not. Or it could be someone who doesn't know their mother's carrier status, but there's a family history of hemophilia on the maternal side in a grandfather or an uncle. So for these women and girls, both testing considerations apply and they would likely need to have genetic testing at some point in their lives to answer this question of genetic transmission. So then it moves to when should genetic testing for potential carriers be done? Unfortunately, I don't really have a clear cut answer for this one as there's a lot of different factors to consider. Historically, back when women were believed to be silent carriers with no abnormal bleeding symptoms, it was considered unethical to do genetic testing on minors, so less than 16 or 18 years old, to determine their hemophilia carrier status as being a carrier was not thought to affect their health at all. So finding out your carrier status was something that women could choose to do as adults when they were able to make that decision themselves, often when considering pregnancy or pregnant. However, with all this new research showing that carriers can have abnormal bleeding symptoms, even with normal factor levels, this practice of delaying genetic testing is starting to be reassessed by both families and healthcare providers. Genetic testing of minors is not something that should ever be taken lightly, but most major go health governing bodies, such as the Canadian Pediatric Society, they do agree to the genetic testing of minors when it's to their medical benefit to allow for adequate medical monitoring, prophylaxis or treatment in a child who is at risk for a condition that will occur in childhood. So for example, if there was a potential carrier who was experiencing abnormal bleeding symptoms, but is a minor, genetic testing might be the correct decision in this situation. But it's just important to keep in mind there's other factors to consider. What are the different cultural considerations where this person lives? Would this person knowing definitively their carrier status, will that affect their future opportunities or not? Are there financial implications? Now, how beliefs around carrier testing have evolved in the past few decades is actually something we're currently doing a research project on to explore the issue a little bit more. And I'll quickly mention that at the end in case anyone's interested in participating. But those are sort of the two big things about testing considerations for genetic transmission. So the next question, oh, there we go. The next question to determine is what is the individual bleeding risk for any carrier of hemophilia or potential carrier of hemophilia? So factor assays are how we measure the amount of clotting factor in a person's blood. A normal factor level is considered to be between about 0.5 to 1.5 units per milliliter. And this is often expressed as a percentage, which is why you hear that less than 1% for severe hemophilia. So as I mentioned earlier, the majority of carriers will have a factor level between 40 and 60%. However, factor levels are known for varying widely among carriers and can even vary throughout a person's life. Factor eight in particular is notorious for going up and down in different circumstances such as pregnancy, or it can even be affected by some medications. 
But factor level testing is extremely important to identify those carriers who have abnormal factor levels and are in fact women and girls with hemophilia. A study that was done in France recently compared over 400 females with mild hemophilia to the same number of males with mild hemophilia. And they looked specifically at the average age of diagnosis. So what they found was that women and girls with mild hemophilia were diagnosed about six years later than men and boys with hemophilia. And the most, and what is very important is that the average age of diagnosis for women and girls with hemophilia was almost 17 years old which is a pretty, uh, pretty late to be finding out that you have an abnormal factor level. And it's well after when you would be getting your first period, for example. But factor level is not the only step in determining bleeding risk. As we know from our five categories on our graphic, that there are symptomatic hemophilia carriers who have a normal factor level, but who experience abnormal bleeding. So for these women and girls, one of the ways we can try to determine their individual bleeding risk is to take a bleeding history, which can be done using a bleeding assessment tool. Bleeding assessment tools are essentially surveys, which ask a series of questions about a person's bleeding history, including details on the frequency of symptoms, whether medical treatment or medical intervention was required, and to what extent. Bleeding assessment tools have a scoring key, and so each answer will be assigned a score and then the total number of points becomes that person's bleeding score. So this bleeding score will either be below a certain cutoff and will be considered normal, or it will be above a certain cutoff and be considered abnormal, which means that this person has a bleeding tendency or a bleeding phenotype. So a hemophilia carrier with a normal factor level, but who has an abnormal bleeding score would likely fall into that category of a symptomatic hemophilia carrier. Bleeding assessment tools are often used by healthcare providers at patient appointments while they do the bleeding history. But Dr. James and her team actually modified one of the tools so that it can be self-administered and taken online by individuals on their own. So if you or anyone you know is interested in finding out their bleeding score, the self-fact can be taken at www.letstalkperiod.ca. And this is a website that's actually run by our team here in Kingston, and it has links to lots of different resources about menstrual health and bleeding disorders, but it also gives access to the self-bat. So we've established that some hemophilia carriers can and do experience abnormal bleeding symptoms, but what does that look like? What are the most commonly observed abnormal bleeding symptoms? So as you see on the slide here, these would be epistaxis, which is nosebleeds, particularly ones that last longer than 15 minutes, excessive bruising, bleeding after procedures, whether that's dental procedures or post-surgical bleeding, postpartum bleeding, which can be immediate or delayed. Oral cavity bleeding isn't actually on this list, but it's bleeding of the gums and teeth, and it can, is also very common. And there is emerging evidence that hemophilia carriers can experience joint bleeding. So this was reported in a study that found hemophilia carriers to have decreased range of motion in their joints as early as the teenage years. And the, the um, researchers found that this was suggestive of some subclinical musculoskeletal bleeding, so little joint bleeds. But the most common reported abnormal bleeding symptom is heavy menstrual bleeding, which is why we have a few more details on that here. So heavy menstrual bleeding is characterized by things such as a period that lasts longer than seven days, if protection needs to be changed every hour, if there are clots larger than a quarter, if you're using more than one type of protection pad or tampon at a time, or if you're soaking the sheets at night. Now you don't necessarily need all of those things to be true, and I hope they're not all true for anyone on the call. But if any of those are present, it's a pretty good indication that you should speak to your family doctor or your gynecologist about it. Heavy menstrual bleeding is particularly important because it can lead to a number of things such as iron deficiency anemia, a reduced health-related quality of life, interruptions to work or school, or even hospitalizations and blood transfusions. Iron deficiency, for example, is very important and it's diagnosed by a low ferritin level which when accompanied by low hemoglobin becomes iron deficiency anemia. It's a frequent finding in women with heavy menstrual bleeding 
particularly those who also have um, a bleeding disorder. And the most common symptoms are fatigue and decreased concentration. But it's important to know about it because it can be treated with iron supplementation, either oral IV. And many of those symptoms are, they really improve with proper treatment. Heavy menstrual bleeding is very difficult for all women, but particularly for our young girls, as it can cause isolation from family and friends, missed days from school, avoidance of social events or sporting events for fear of staining clothing. And all of these things can negatively affect the confidence and the self-image of the adolescent that's suffering. So it's just important that heavy menstrual bleeding is identified because then it can be treated properly and we can hopefully avoid some of these negative consequences. So in regards to treatment, we have now clearly established that women affected by hemophilia can have abnormal bleeding. So what can we do about it? And the good news is, is that there's actually a lot we can do about it. I'm just gonna give a brief overview of three of these different options, but I do want to highlight that all treatment decisions are going to be specific to an individual. And as such, it should be discussed with your healthcare team as not every treatment is going to be right for everyone. So the first one to highlight is one of our most widely used ones, and it is tranexamic acid, which is an antifibrinolytic agent, which works to prevent breakdown of clots in the mucocutaneous parts of the body, such as the mouth or the uterus. It's useful for both hemophilia A and B, as it works not specifically on either factor eight or nine, but it works outside that pathway to just help stabilize the blood clot. It's a treatment that can be used in symptomatic hemophilia carriers who have normal factor levels. For example, if you or another carrier experiences excessive bleeding with dental procedures like dental extractions, tranexamic acid can be a great option in that circumstance. The next treatment category is desmopressin, which we often refer to as DDAVP. So this is a synthetic hormone that can be given intravenously in a vein, subcutaneously, as an injection under the skin, or even intranasally as a nasal spray. Although unfortunately right now in Canada, we don't have access to the nasal spray, but we hope it will come back soon. Now desmopressin does not work in factor nine deficiencies, so hemophilia B, but it can be useful for women with mild hemophilia A and abnormal factor eight levels, and even sometimes in symptomatic carriers. A test for responsiveness has to be done as desmopressin does not work for everybody, but in some circumstances, it can just significantly increase your factor eight level and activity. And so it was really useful prior to procedures and things like that to prevent any excessive bleeding. So the last treatment option is the clotting factor concentrates, which replace the missing clotting factor, whether it's eight or nine. So this is used as a treatment in severe forms of hemophilia, and it's not normally used in carriers. However, as we discussed, women and girls with hemophilia should have access to the same treatments that men have access to. So for example, if there was a woman with mild hemophilia B who was having a major surgical procedure, this might be someone in whom factor concentrate is needed beforehand to prevent bleeding. And then our little graphic at the end there is just the last reminder that there are so many different ways hemophilia can affect women. And so it's really important to just speak to your own healthcare team about what would be an appropriate treatment for your individual situation. Now, keeping with the treatment theme, I have a separate slide here devoted to heavy menstrual bleeding as there's lots of different options. Sometimes a few options need to be tried before finding the right one for an individual. And even then the treatment plan for heavy menstrual bleeding can really evolve based on the needs of the woman. Taking, to, taking into account things like, is she actively trying to conceive? Is she trying to prevent contraception? Does she want to preserve her future fertility or not? As I mentioned on the other slide, tranexamic acid can be used in heavy menstrual bleeding, sometimes on its own, but often as an add-on to other therapy but the first line is usually hormone therapy. So this can take many different forms, whether it's the oral contraceptive pills, injectables, implants, dermal patches, IUDs, there are lots of options out there. All of them in essence though, aim to reduce both the length and the frequency of menstruation to just reduce the overall flow, quantity of flow overall. <laughs> 
There are also surgical options that can be used, but these will affect a woman's ability to conceive. So that will just need to be taken into account. Endometrial ablation is done via the vagina. So it doesn't evolve, involve any cutting, but it destroys the lining of the uterus, which is what is normally shed during your period. And so it can greatly reduce or even eliminate menstrual bleeding for a number of years or sometimes permanently. Then hysterectomy is a surgical procedure where the entire uterus is removed to permanently stop menstrual bleeding. Since there are so many different options and also because heavy menstrual bleeding can have other causes unrelated to a bleeding disorder, we personally as a clinic recommend that all hemophilia carriers with abnormal menstrual bleeding be offered a referral to a gynecologist. And if possible, because there are a few that exist in Canada, including one here in Kingston, this can be done in a woman in bleeding disorders clinic where both hematology and gynecology work together to care for patients. So an important issue for many hemophilia carriers are the different considerations around pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum. There is lots and lots that can be said on this topic. So I really would encourage any person who is listening to this and is a carrier and is pregnant or considering pregnancy to reach out to their local hemophilia treatment center for a more detailed conversation about this topic. But we'll go over it quickly right now. A mother who is a carrier and is pregnant is recommended that she be seen by an obstetrician, ideally in conjunction with a hematologist in order to provide the best care. So during pregnancy, factor eight levels will rise significantly most of the time, which does reduce the risk of bleeding during pregnancy and childbirth, but we do not see the same thing with factor nine levels. The factor level a woman reaches in her third trimester will have implications for the delivery plan, but it should be noted that after delivery, the factor levels will go back down to their pre-pregnancy levels, which puts all women affected by hemophilia at an increased risk for postpartum hemorrhage, whether immediate or delayed. Carriers should be advised to contact their healthcare team if they have excessive bleeding postpartum. And in some cases, postpartum bleeding can be treated prophylactically as a preventative measure, sometimes using something like tranexamic acid. In regard to the child, parents can be offered genetic counseling in advance of a planned pregnancy if possible, just about the likelihood of having an affected child and what that, the implications are. There are some conception options that can be discussed at that time if the family is interested, things like IVF with pre-implantation diagnosis, egg donation, sperm sorting, et cetera. Prenatal diagnosis of a potentially affected male child is the standard of care in many places, but ultimately it's always the choice of the parents whether to do so or not. There can be a concern about head bleeding during the birth of a severely affected male baby and the event of a traumatic delivery. But again, I just want to refer anyone who is considering pregnancy or is pregnant to have a more detailed conversation with their healthcare team about these topics. So where should women affected by hemophilia be cared for? The answer to this is going to depend on where in those five categories of our graphic the individual falls into. But the primary healthcare provider should always be a part of the team as there are many things that they can help treat, such as abnormal menstrual bleeding or iron deficiency, especially if there's already a treatment plan in place for that abnormal menstrual bleeding. We do recommend though, that all hemophilia carriers, regardless of which of the five categories you fall into, connect with their local um, hemophilia treatment center. And whether or not you're followed there on a regular basis will again depend on things like if you're having abnormal symptoms, are you a woman and girl with hemophilia, et cetera. All carriers should connect with an HGC prior or during pregnancy as well. And then if you, it exists in your clinic, women in, bleed, in your area, sorry, Women in bleeding disorder clinics are a great way to care for women affected by hemophilia who also have gynecological concerns. So this is where hem um, hematology and gynecology see the patients together in order to just provide the best possible care. So one of the things we've added to this presentation is just a quick overview of some of the places that you can find resources as a hemophilia carrier. So the first one I'm gonna highlight is our very own Canadian Hemophilia Society. And I'm gonna go a little bit fast because I think most people on this call will already be familiar with it. And um, so the first spot to find info is just in the bleeding disorders heading. They have a whole section devoted to women in bleeding disorders. 
This isn't exclusive to hemophilia, as it includes other disorders such as von Willebrand's disease, but many of the symptoms and treatments are the same, and there's a lot of helpful information. So for example, there is a segment on treatment, uh, treatment options available, many of which is exactly the same as what I just told you, but it's just a good place to find extra information if that's what you're looking for. The Canadian Hemophilia Society also has a print catalog with PDF resources available for download. So one is specific to carriers and it's called All About Carriers. And the second is again um, about women and bleeding disorders in general, but there's lots of stuff that applies to carriers. They are getting a little bit old. They're from 2003 and 2007. So some of the terminology and updates I've just mentioned won't necessarily be in there. But depending on where you're coming from, there's a lot of great information. And then the last CHS resource to highlight is actually a conference. Now, some of you may have already attended or heard about it, but it's called Code Rouge and it was held online this past September. So this is a conference that is specific to women in bleeding disorders. And there's always lots of great presenters and a lot of good, very updated information. So they'll actually be posting videos of this year's session on YouTube. So I would recommend you check that out if you didn't already attend. There's a really interesting talk about iron deficiency and the pros and cons of oral versus IV um, therapy, which is definitely worth your while. The next place to find resources is the World Federation of Hemophilia. Um, and they have an enormous amount, almost too many, but if you ever need resources in different languages, it's a great place to start. So if you go into their e-learning center, you see they have a whole section devoted to carriers and women with hemophilia. And you'll find both an information section and a resources section. So the information section is a lot like an FAQ and it covers a lot of the topics I've talked about today, including the treatment of bleeding. And it's very updated. Um, in the resources section, there's a whole bunch of videos. And one of the ones you'll find is this one called Women and Girls with Hemophilia. And it's from the WFH virtual summit in 2020. And it's an excellent video. And in it, they discuss uh, that study where from France, where they found that women and girls with mild hemophilia were diagnosed about six years later than men. It's just a really great talk and like very updated, especially for anyone who is a carrier and has abnormal factor levels. But there's so many resources depending on what you're looking for. The last set of resources to cover is actually the Lex Tech period website, which is operated by us here in Kingston. So it gives access to the self fat, as I mentioned, but there's lots of other resources as well. So there are resources specific to menstrual bleeding covering what's normal and abnormal. There is a really great toolkit designed for teachers that covers bleeding disorders and abnormal, abnormal menstrual bleeding. And it includes things like a lesson plan for teachers who are giving health courses, just so that they can help increase awareness as to what is normal, what is abnormal, things like that. There's a lot of great resources for nurses to use with bleeding disorder patients. And there was a really great new reference guide for primary care providers all about bleeding disorders in women. And then coming very soon, there's going to be resources for hemophilia carriers. So I've actually used some of the graphics in this presentation and I have a little sneak peek up on the screen now. So those will be up there pretty quickly. So the hemophilia carrier specific resources I just previewed were something that we developed as part of a research project last year. So we held two different virtual focus groups with 11 hemophilia carriers total who also completed a short survey. Now we covered lots of different issues related to carriers with the aim to discover what the current challenges and knowledge gaps are for carriers today and what type of information would they like more of. In the surveys, we asked carriers if they felt there were enough resources out there and if it was easy to find information and the majority of carriers said no to both questions. We also asked carriers which topics they wanted more information on and the top through three were variations in bleeding tendencies, treatment options and testing considerations. So these were all things that I took into consideration for this presentation and in making our um, hemophilia carrier specific resources. But one of the most insightful parts of that research project really came from the focus group discussions where carriers identified as a whole, four main challenges and knowledge gaps from their experiences. 
So this is a pretty text heavy slide, but I'm just gonna go through each section because I think it's very interesting and important for everyone to know. So the first general topic that was discussed was the psychosocial impacts of abnormal bleeding, which included things like increased anxiety, low self-esteem, missed opportunities and experiences. And so what's important to note is that these negative impacts increased when symptoms went untreated or unrecognized. And subsequently, the negative impacts usually improved when the symptoms were properly treated and, and the symptoms improved as well. Carriers who knew their carrier status and were connected with a hemophilia treatment center from a young age, they often described less of these negative psychosocial impacts, and they felt it was due to the fact that their abnormal bleeding symptoms were promptly recognized and treated. For each category, I've chosen just one participant quote to kind of sum up the experience a little bit. And the quote for this one is, when I had my period throughout my teens and experienced symptoms, there was nothing about being a symptomatic carrier. I sort of suffered in silence and those things at school, anxiety, self-esteem were all certainly affected. This just highlighted to us as healthcare providers, the importance of early recognition of abnormal bleeding symptoms so that women and girls aren't suffering in silence on their own. The next category were the difficulties that carriers faced in determining symptom significance, always questioning and feeling unsure as to whether a given symptom was normal or not, and whether it would be appropriate to seek treatment. The participant quote says, even now treatment guidelines for women with bleeding disorders are very vague. It's still very vague. Should we be using tranexamic acid or desmopressin? Moving forward, I'd like to see some consistency around when I should treat myself. So carriers described a tendency to underestimate the severity of their bleeding, which led to delays in seeking care and receiving treatment and more of that suffering in silence. For some carriers, this hesitancy was because of previous negative experiences where their bleeding symptoms were dismissed by healthcare providers. And so they felt that seeking care was pointless. This was true even for carriers who had normal, who had abnormal factor eight and factor nine levels and who have mild hemophilia. And then after a given symptom was treated or a management plan was created, carriers expressed both relief and frustration. They felt relief that now the symptom was being treated, but they felt frustrated that they had not um, sought care earlier and instead had suffered in silence. The third major category that was brought up kind of follows those negative experiences that carriers described. And it was this constant need to self-advocate and not always feeling like they had the knowledge or the resources to do that. Participants described encounters with healthcare providers who were not aware or did not believe that hemophilia carriers could have abnormal bleeding or, or even abnormal factor levels. Having to advocate for themselves and prove the legit legitimacy of their experiences was really frustrating for several of the participants, particularly the women and girls with hemophilia who have abnormal factor levels. It was described as constantly trying to convince healthcare providers that they're credible and not lying or attention seeking. Our participant quote for this category is, my GP is old fashioned and didn't believe that I could be symptomatic. It took the hemophilia treatment center intervening with my GP to tell her no, X person can have bleeding as well. It really makes it easier on me because it's hard to advocate for yourself when you're going up against a doctor because they have the credentials. So I was blessed to have the support from the hemophilia treatment center. And the last category encompassed the various testing concerns that were raised by um, participants. They describe what they felt were inconsistent recommendations around hemophilia carrier testing, both factor level and genetic. They, some of them encountered testing refusal from their healthcare providers and situations where delayed testing or diagnosis led to untreated or missed symptoms. Participants who had learned their carrier status at a young age felt that growing up with this knowledge was beneficial to them, both because it led to more prompt symptom recognition and treatment, but also because they were able to gradually incorporate the knowledge and implications into their sense of self. A few of our participants voiced strong concerns around access to testing for female children. One participant, our participant quote for this category is, it is one area of care that I suppose is forgotten, the in-between birth and testing. I was very supported in my pregnancy 
and was told that we would test my daughter closer to the age of consent or if she needed to be for a procedure. But after that, there wasn't much of a plan for emergency situations like we encountered, as this patient had encountered an emergency situation or not knowing the carrier status or the factor level of her daughter was a detriment. So as a healthcare provider, it was so helpful to hear about these different experiences. And I wanna thank all of our participants who were part of the study. As we hear from carriers firsthand about what they see as the current challenges and knowledge gaps, it really enables us to then hopefully do something about it to try and make these things a little bit easier. We will soon be publishing a full report with all this information and more just so that more people can learn about it and that more can be done. So that's the end of our presentation for today. Um, I'll just mention really quickly that the concerns around testing that were brought up in those focus groups is actually something that we've turned into a follow-up research project. And we're currently recruiting parents of hemophilia carriers or potential hemophilia carriers to just hear their thoughts on what they think about carrier testing, both factor level and genetic. So if that is something that might interest you or you know someone else who fits the bill, feel free to contact me at my email there. So that's all for today. Um, a big thank you to Hemophilia Ontario and Natalie for organizing this. And thank you everyone for attending. I believe it's opening up for questions, but I will let uh, Natalie take over for that.